Timothy Flanders is on to discuss tradition. Are we bound to obey those things that are passed down by word of mouth or only by epistle? The Binding Force of Tradition coming up next. Praise be to God. Good morning to you, Timothy Flanders. Thank you, brother. Happy to be here. Jesus is king. How are you doing? Amen. I am alive and that counts. And uh, there you go. Praise be to God. Uh, 1 Peter 5, real quick before we jump in. How's that going? Excellent. Very blessed uh, to be on board with 1 Peter 5. Uh, our mission is rebuilding Christendom and restoring Catholic culture and tradition. All right. Well, God is very good. I want to jump into talking about tradition. Um, there was a, you had a recent debate with uh, Michael Lofton, somebody who's been on our program several times. We love Michael Lofton here uh, about the binding force of tradition. And, you know, this is interesting to me because um, I have grown to love the tradition of the church kind of slowly in many ways. So we've only uh, been going full time to the TLM now for the past year and a half or so. Prior to that, it was a, a Latin Nova Sordo for, for many years. And prior to that, it's your typical Nova Sordo in the suburban parish. So it's kind of been a slowly boiling kind of a thing for, for me and my family. And one of the questions that's kind of come up in my mind uh, recently and seeing the trend of people going towards traditional Latin uh, masses is what is tradition? Uh, what is tradition? I feel like so many of us uh, more recent devotees to the TLM really don't have a good concept of what tradition is. So before we talk about the binding force of tradition, let me ask you, what is the tradition of the church? Yeah, sure. Uh, tradition, the term tradition is both a noun and a verb in its original Greek and Latin, uh, paradosis, which means to pass down the thing that is passed down. And so this refers not only to the deposit of faith and the scripture and tradition contained in various catechisms, but it's also including everything else that's passed down, everything that's your smallest little custom, like the, the meal that you eat at Michaelmas or the dance that you dance at Christmas or whatever, which are just oral, oral customs, the ways we dress, things like that. Those are all passed down. And they're all guarded under the virtue of piety, which is the virtue by which we honor and revere our elders, and we receive what is passed down to us. So let's talk about St. Paul then, and his words to Timothy, to hold fast to the traditions that were handed on, either by word of mouth or by letter. What does Paul mean by that when he says that? Yeah, I, I believe you're referring to 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It's 14 in the Dewey Reams. Um, so it's, it's saying, uh, let me just read that. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or by epistle. So this is referring to what St. Paul went to the church and he taught them everything orally. And he also wrote them letters. So he taught them things that they should be bound to and passed down. And they should take these things and then pass them down to their children. This is also in, in the letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul says, I am handing down to you what I received. He received something. He's passing it down to them, which is the, the Holy mass, the Eucharist. You know, it's, it would seem to me that the vast majority of, of Catholics, other than talking heads, um, ivory tower warriors, people, you know, people like that, people like I include myself in that category. Uh, I, is, other than that, the vast majority of Catholics, the average lay person who's just trying to get by through the day, they've got medical bills and they've got car problems and they've got kid problems and marriage problems and groceries to buy. And they, they don't understand the nuances and they wouldn't begin to know what traditions are, are, are sort of uh, obligatory versus which ones are optional. How does the average Catholic begin to sort out the, what is the tradition, what is traditional, what is optional? That's a great question, because we live in a time where that's in question. And the problem is we have, you know, before we might say, we might just put 1800 as a, as a, as a note. Um, before this time, there was this strong binding force of oral custom. So if you read, for example, St. Alphonsus Liguori's Moral Theology, he talks about all these moral questions. And then he says, but if, cust if it's customary, then let it be. And there's this strong... Uh, deference to custom, but 
Our Lady of La- Our Lady of Good Counsel predicted that in the 20th century there'd be an overthrow of customs, and so there's all these oral traditions, and I think fashion is a great example, because how should you dress? Well, that's passed down to you orally. It's taught to you by your father and your mother. They tell you how to dress, but if there's a breakdown in the in the generations, then the next generation dresses differently, and the next generation after that dresses differently, and everyone's forgotten how people are supposed to dress, all these things. And it's all oral is the problem. Nobody wrote down a manual and said, okay, here's everything everybody needs to pass on. It's all oral. And so the problem when we have these discussions is that we're in a period where everyone's forgotten all these different customs. Another great example is courtship. How, how are you supposed to do courtship? That was all oral once upon a time. Now it's all up in the air. Nobody knows what to do. Everybody's forgotten about everything. So We live in a time where we need to restore these customs and restore these oral traditions and these different things that were passed down to us because we've forgotten them. And so that's a very difficult thing to do because it does involve recovering certain things that are oral and that were basically assumed for centuries. Nobody wrote them down because everybody just did them. And they were also being communicated orally. So how do we do this? It's definitely been a lost start. It's definitely been a lost start, I think, in American culture, American evangelical culture. And, you know, the immigrants come here, and then after several generations, they've lost the customs they brought with them. And now my own, like my own history, my family, you know, immigrated from Scotland and England eight in the 18th century so like we're so far removed from even those customs those ideas that uh we we simply it's just lost to history there's no there's no concept of it i think that's part of it would you say oh absolutely this is this is the changing world that we live in there's immigration and there's the economy is entirely different And there's this breakdown of generations. And so the family is understood only as the nuclear family and not the extended family. And so, and every new generation reinvents itself. It has a new fashion, new music style, all new sorts of customs. Every new generation is broken from the generation before it. And so we need to restore. So it starts, part of it is recovering the traditions, recovering the customs as much as we can, reading about them. We're, We're publishing an article series at 1 Peter 5 called The Forgotten Customs of this feast or that feast. So every big feast will have a big forgotten customs article. And um, hold that thought. Uh, His podcast, his YouTube channel is The Meaning of Catholic. He's also the editor of 1 Peter 5. Uh, Highly encourage you to check that out. Good, Good morning to you again, Timothy Flanders. Yes, good morning. Praise be to God. We're having a conversation about tradition. And uh, just over the break, I was talking to Adrian, my producer. And uh, I, I keep going back to this big issue of, at least in my mind, how if you thought of all Catholics everywhere as a pie chart, this faintest sliver would be the, the would represent those Catholics that are super plugged in, super into the nuance, super into like sort of the the, the, the details of of teaching and and uh, and whatnot, the magisterium, all that. The rest of Catholics I find are just surviving the day and probably aren't as plugged in and aren't asking the difficult questions, let alone knowing how to sort fact from fiction out. Um, you know, Adrian, you had a question about uh, attire and how that relates to what I just said. Right. I had a the thing that you were talking about clothing really reminded me of a, a debate that's constantly being had among uh, people trying to figure out what's the proper decorum to have at mass. And so you have people like, oh, well, do I need to wear a tie? Do I need to wear a coat? Uh, among the ladies, there are people who are like, oh, I can wear pants or no, I have to wear a skirt and uh, so on and so forth. And the, they always come back to, well, show me a document of the church where it says, I have to wear X, Y, or Z. Show me in the in a church document where it officially declares, oh yes, if you're a Catholic man, you need to wear a tie to Mass. Or if you're a Catholic woman, you have to wear a dress to Mass. Um, and they're like, well, it doesn't exist because we lost this idea of tradition. Could you speak about that and how do we reclaim these things that are just been, that are just, they're gone. They're not recorded. Yeah, that's exactly the problem is that there are there is this binding force of tradition by custom, which is passed down orally, and you just don't have documents because the church did not f- find it necessary to confirm what everyone already believed and passed down. So there, this is the this is the it's insufficiency of asking that question because there's a bigger authority there. How do we recover that? Well, thankfully, there has been a lot written down, and that's what we're doing at One Peter Five is the, re- the Forgotten Traditions series. So there's been a lot written down on various customs 
So we do, we can recover a lot of these things. We can find out what our forefathers were doing. Some of these need to be translated into our own context. Like some things in Europe don't always apply to North America or especially like in the Southern hemisphere because they have different climate. So it's part of it's about adapting it to your own climate. And then that also goes into, we do need to actually create our own customs. So for example, at Michaelmas, we, our family read about a, a custom in um, Catholic all year round by um, Mrs. Tierney. They, uh, they beat up a Satan pinata for Michaelmas. And so this is their tradition. And this is something that they just made up. And so part of these things are making up traditions, which are just expressing the same faith and morals, but just in a new way, because we do need to create something new to pass it down again. You know, we, we interviewed her. Uh, it was a great interview, great conversation. And sort of the impetus for that interview was Maria von Trapp. And, uh, uh, yes. and and her writing that's been now republished, Sophia's got a, a copy out. There's been others, um, you know, around the year with the Von Trops and how it, it's amazing to me when you read that, how she has imbued the Catholic faith in every segment of her family life, 24-7, 365, every day had some element of the Catholic faith lived and breathed in her home, in her village, and, and in her community. And to me, when I think of what is the tradition, I think of that. I think of how the Catholic faith is lived and breathed in, in the community. And again, I just think that's just been totally lost. Now, is it po- you, you said the way we recover, but how do we rec- how is it possible to recover that? Well, it starts in the family, and this is something that everybody, even, you know, a Catholic who doesn't read a bunch of, you know, PhD or whatever in theology, you don't need to have a bunch of academic knowledge to remember your childhood when you did X, Y, and Z on this day, when you had St. Nicholas Day and you had your shoes out or whatever, or various things like that, various customs and things that you enjoyed as a child, which you now want to pass down to your your own children. This is what you do when you get married. You talk to your spouse about what did you do when you grew up, <clears throat> excuse me, and what do you want to pass down to your children? And so this is this, this is this custom, which becomes this sort of habit that you just assume that everybody should do. That's how you recover it. You started in the children, you, you teach it to your children. They grow up loving it and wanting to pass it down to the next generation. Well, that leads to a great question, which is um, if these are just, you know, these are pious traditions. These are great things. Someone might respond and say, well, Timothy, this is great and all. And yeah, it'd be cool to have these traditions in, in, in place. But, you know, they're not really, it's not part of the magisterium. It's not, it's not an official document of the church. So I don't have to obey those things. I can just do my own thing. What would you say to uh, that kind of response? Well, our, our, our obligations as Catholics are not, restricted to acts of the marriage magisterium because those acts in fact are the more the the less frequent of our obligations our, our more frequent and more ordinary obligations have to do with scripture and tradition when we read in the holy scriptures and what the scriptures tell us and what the tradition tells us and the magisterium is there to clarify various things ex- in an extraordinary way especially um but the, the force of custom, the obligatory force of custom is very large. St. Thomas says custom is the force of law. And so it's, it's when you start to think that way, when you reduce everything as a Catholic to only what the Pope has said or what the magisterium has said on this and that point, you're reducing the whole Catholic life with what Joe was just saying. The Catholic life is 365, 24-7. That's the whole uh, Catholic, when we talk about Catholic being the whole thing, when you reduce it to one aspect of that, you start to reduce it and you start to break down the traditions. You start to break down the tra- generations. So then your, your children are breaking apart from you and the next generation. This is what, this is the problem we have today. And this is this type of thinking is what has caused this. Well, you know, we have people today, which uh, we call themselves the progressivists, and G.K. Chesterton famously said, progressivists are really good at breaking things, and conservatives are really good at making sure they don't get fixed. <laughs> um, and the uh, and so people might say, make the argument, and say, well, you know, we are progressed, we have gone through history, and we've decided to reject a lot of these traditions, and we have tried to accept the ones that we're creating right now. Uh, so why not just uh, keep progressing? Why, why, what's wrong with, like, what's wrong with being a progressivist well it's it ultimately is a denial of truth itself because truth itself is passed down truth goodness and beauty are passed down from your forefathers and they're passed down to you and there must be a proper healthy organic relationship with the past 
so that it's just a, in the same way as I raise my children, they become different people than I am, but we have the same faith and the same morals. And so there is a development in the sense of there's a deepening, there's a, a progression, there's a certain progression. So we can't reject absolutely everything progressing whatsoever, because then that would, that would lead to an extreme reaction. And that's what we have. We have extreme reactions on both sides. So there needs to be this organic link where the, gener the generations are one with one, they're one with each other. There's not a rebellion of sons against the father. Uh, the, the prophet says, the Holy Ghost says in the scriptures, St. John the Baptist will come to turn the hearts to their fathers and the fathers of the children and to turn them, turn them together. This is the union of, of the family life. And so progressivism ultimately destroys the family. It destroys truth, goodness, and beauty. And that's why we have an ugly world. Janice? I was going to ask, Timothy, as a Catholic woman, um, you know, I, I'm uh, married and uh, my husband and I, we talk a lot about liturgical living and how we want to develop that in our home. So something that comes to my mind is that I love that you say that the family is the uh, the source that passes down tradition. And as women, I think that uh, one of the major roles of passing down this tr this tradition is homemaking and liturgical living. So, what would you say to women in uh, Catholic women today? Uh, how how can they foster this liturgical living in their home to pass down this tradition? I, I will say, uh, have you ever stepped into an ugly church? And then compare that to the way that you stepped into a beautiful church and the feeling that you had. This is this is the effect of uh, a woman on a household is that uh, the the mother and the wife creates this beautiful environment. It looks good. It smells good. It's homey. It, this is something that I, as a man, I'm very incapable of doing. And I'm <laughs> very, very thankful to my wife for making this house into a home. And this is something that has such a huge impact on children as they grow up. Children don't understand all these nuances of, of doctrinal, but they understand beauty. They understand go the goodness, the, just this intrinsic goodness of fun, creating these things. And this is something that mothers have just this intuitive sense and they know how to do it, that men are just lost in the clouds of all this whatever, and they miss that. And it's such a concrete, it's a concretization of the tradition. I think that it's absolutely fundamental. That's why women are really the pillar of Christian civilization, because mm. they form that early youth before there's even the age of reason. So it's critical. That's an excellent point. You know, in the last segment, I was commenting on this legislation that would force our ladies to, our young women to uh, uh, register for the selective service for the draft and how I commented on how that was a, a violation, in my, at least in my take, on the dignity of the human person because women weren't created to fight wars. That's not their vocation. That's not who they are. And uh, I just think you spoke to that very beautifully about uh, how they have this wonderful role uh, to create this beautiful environment that speaks so eloquently to all souls. Um, in the last uh, minute here with Timothy Flanders, the meaning of Catholic and also editor of 1 Peter 5. So uh, t talk to me real quick about binding force of tradition. You got about a minute. Yeah, well, what you need to do is look up Chad Ripperger, The Binding Force of Tradition. It's a short book. It's uh, 52 pages. You need to go buy the book. And he talks about the binding force of tradition in far more uh, detail than I can do in a minute, but it, it's essentially, it's in those scripture passages that we mentioned, the binding force of tradition. St. Paul also says, if we or an angel from heaven come to you and preach another gospel, then what you have received, let him be anathema. That's the binding force of tradition. You've received the tradition, you've understood it, you know it, and then you know when there's a deviation from it. All right. Well, praise be to God. The Meaning of Catholic and 1 Peter 5, uh, Timothy Flanders, thank you for your time today. We're very grateful. God bless you and God love you. Thank you, brother. God bless. All right. That's going to do it for hour number one of Catholic Drive Time. Praise be to God. If you like that interview, then be sure to check out some of our other interviews that you might find fascinating. And don't forget to like and subscribe and share this interview with someone that you think will find this informative and inspiring. God love you.